Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson six, more on the infinite square well, superpositions of stationary states, and a little introduction to Dirac notation. Now, first of all, let's consider a wave function that's made up of components. Each component is a stationary state, a normalized, orthonormal stationary state of the potential. In this case, it's the infinite square well. Now, how do we get the values of these coefficients? Well, if we know what the total wave function we want is, in other words, if we know the function we're shooting for, we can do a trick. It's called Fourier's trick. What you do is you multiply both sides of the first equation by psi star sub n, where n is an arbitrary integer, and then you integrate over the domain of the potential, in this case uh, from one side of the well to the other side of the well, and, uh, and you fiddle around. Now notice that what we have here is an integral of a sum, and that's the same as the sum of the integrals. But the integral you see on the right hand side, the psi star n psi m, you already know the answer to that one. It uh, is determined by the orthonormality of the stationary states and it's a delta nm, the Kronecker delta. So it's only one if n and m match. But the sum is over all m, but the uh, n is a single integer, one of the states, and so only one term survives the sum. And so you get that the nth coefficient is just the integral of psi star n on the total wave function you want to try to create via superposition. Okay. Now let's say we start with that same superposition, but let's express it in a slightly different way. This is about Dirac notation. Dirac notation is a shorthand that enables us to write down complicated expressions without as much labor. So basically it's a labor-saving device. Um, the idea is to replace the wave function with a ket. It's what's called a ket. And each of the stationary states becomes a ket with just the number of the stationary state. So these two statements mean exactly the same thing. In other words, we're going to suppress the space dependence of the wave function, but we know it's there. It's just that we don't have to write it all out each time. And then instead of writing out explicit integrals, we use a slightly different notation with a bracket symbol that faces the other way. It's called a bracket, or it's supposed to be like bracket, but it's called a bracket. Um, it's a combination of a backwards ket and another ket, and it really is just a shorthand for the explicit integral that you could calculate by taking phi star and multiplying by psi and integrating over all x, or integrating over the domain of the problem. Now, if you flop the psi and the phi, then you can see right away that what you get is the complex conjugate. In other words, if you switch the psi and the phi, you get the complex conjugate of whatever it was you had before. Now remember how we found the coefficients before with the uh, detailed integral expressions that went over all x. We can do the same computation without having to write out all the integrals using the Dirac, Bra, and Ket notation. We can hit the left hand side of our psi with the Bra n and uh, you can see that the same trick happens. The bra acting on the sum is the same as the sum of the bras acting on the individual kets. And again, the uh, n on m is the integral of psi star n psi m, and that is delta nm. So once again, the, uh, the result is that the nth coefficient is uh, the bra n acting on the full wave function or the full state psi. So it's, it really means nothing different than what we already have done, except that we don't have to write all the integrals and the dx's and the stars and, and so on. It's really just a time-saving device. And it looks a little weird probably at the beginning, but as you, uh, as you move along, you'll get used to it. There's a useful analogy with vectors as well, like if you're used to vectors like this, where you have a vector A that's got an X and a Y and a Z component. You can think of kets as being a little bit like unit vectors. They're unit vectors that point 
in a direction in state space. It's not real space, it's not physical space, but it's a space of possible quantum states. And uh, the number of directions in that space is the same as the number of possible or basis states. Uh, for example, if we lived in a universe that had uh, three quantum basis states, we might be able to express a vector A or a ket A as a superposition of 1, 2, and 3, a lot like I hat, J hat, and K hat. And A1, A2, and A3 are sort of like the components of A in the 1, 2, and 3 directions. Now, in pointy vector space and positional vector space, we have this idea called a dot product. Well, the bra ket is analogous to exactly such a dot product. It's called the inner product of the vector space. And you can calculate the x component of an arbitrary vector by dotting the vector with i hat. In the same way, you can calculate the component of one of these generic Dirac state vectors by dotting or taking the inner product of the nth basis state with the full vector a. And if you, if you think about that, you realize you can rewrite the vector sum from the top in this way. You'll notice that uh, 1 on a is the same thing as a sub 1, and 2 on a is the same thing as a sub 2, and so on. In general, a sub n is the inner product of the nth basis vector and the full vector a. But uh, if you look at that for a second, you realize you can factor out the ket, the a ket on the right, and you can write it this way. And that is interesting because it says the, the ket a is the product of the ket a with this stuff, the superposition of these bras and kets, 1, 2, and 3. And I should say, if there were a higher dimensional space, if you had more basis vectors, you'd have to increase the size of the sum. But if you think about that, the thing in square brackets is really nothing more than the identity operator. It's an operator which, when acting on a ket, produces the same ket back again. And that is a fundamental theorem of linear algebra. It says if I, if I make a combination of bras and kets like this that includes all the basis vectors that I can create an identity operator by adding them all together, each individual term in the sum is a projector. It's called a projection operator that projects out the nth component of the full vector. And if you add all those projection operators together, then you're not projecting anything, you're not doing anything, you're just multiplying by 1. Let's do an example calculation with this notation just to kind of get the flavor of it. Let's say we wanted to know the Hamiltonian, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian in some state psi. In conventional notation, the way you compute that would be to calculate psi star times the Hamiltonian operator times psi and integrate over all space. Well, in Dirac notation, that same operation can be written as the bra psi uh, inner product with the Hamiltonian operator acting on the ket psi. So uh, what is the ket psi? Remember what the ket psi is, is a superposition of um, basis states, or eigenstates, in this case, they're eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. What do I get if I apply the Hamiltonian operator to that thing? Well, I just apply the Hamiltonian operator to the sum. Of course, the ha Hamiltonian operator is linear. It's a linear operator, which means that the Hamiltonian operating on a sum is, same, is the same thing as the sum of the Hamiltonian operator operating on each individual guy, so I can distribute the Hamiltonian over the individual basis vectors. But remember, these basis vectors are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. This is n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. Each of those has a definite energy. We can call the energies E1, E2, and E3. But uh, you can see now what the Hamiltonian operator does is it multiplies each of the basis states by its corresponding energy. And uh, if I move those guys up to the top and keep going, you'll see that uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is going to be the bra psi acting on this superposition, where each term in the superposition is now multiplied by the corresponding energy. But don't forget what psi is. Psi is C1 times 1 plus C2 times 2 plus C3 times 3. So what is the bra psi going to look like? Well, when you 
when you make a bra, it has to uh, get the bra of each term, plus uh, it's got to include C1, C2, and C3. But remember the behavior of inner products. When you flip them, you get the complex conjugate. So when you flip a ket, you get a bra, but the coefficients are the complex conjugates of the coefficients for the ket. So I'm going to get C1 star times the bra 1, plus C2 star times the bra 2, and so on. And when I multiply these together, I'm going to get a bunch of cross terms. I'll get C1 star E1 C1 and C2 star E1 C1 and C1 star E2 C2 and so on. But notice that uh, I'm also getting the bra 1 on the ket 1, the bra 2 on the ket 1, the bra 1 on the ket 2 and so on. But those are uh, orthonormal so that when 1 and 1 hit each other, you get 1. But when 2 and 1 hit each other, you get nothing. And when 1 and 2 hit each other, you get nothing. When 2 on 2 hits each other, you get 1, and so on. So the only terms in the sum that are going to survive are C1 star C1, C2 star C2, and so on. And each of those is going to get multiplied by the corresponding energy, the energy that corresponds to that state, so that when the smoke clears, you get a result like this, uh, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, is C1 squared, C1 magnitude squared, E1, plus C2 magnitude squared, E2, and so on. But remember what expectation value means. It means the probability of getting E1 times E1, plus the probability of getting E2 times E2, plus the probability of getting E3 times E3, and so on. So what that says is these magnitudes of these coefficients squared is nothing other than the probability of measuring the corresponding energy. So these are the probabilities of measuring E1, E2, E3, and so on. Okay, so that's a little more Dirac notation or the introduction to Dirac notation. It's, it's really not bad. You'll, you'll get used to it as we move along. And also some reminders about how the infinite square well works. Uh, this brings us to Computing Project 3. I want to take a few minutes to discuss Computing Project 3 so you guys are ready for it. Basically, we're going to imagine we have a wave function in an infinite square well where the wave function begins uh, with a uniform probability of finding the particle anywhere on the left half of the well and zero probability of finding the particle on the right half of the well. Last time we worked out the expansion coefficients um, for this situation and we worked out the wave function the wave function is the square root of 2 over a. It's a constant if x is less than a over 2, and it's 0 everywhere else. And the expansion coefficient is a function of n, but uh, these guys are uh, the sum of the squares of these coefficients is 1, because the probability of being in any of these states has to add up to 1. And you can see that uh, these just correspond to the amplitude associated with each of the basis states or each of the eigenstates of this particular Hamiltonian. Uh, what happens to the wave function at later times if it starts out in this state? Well, the answer is you can just take each component and multiply it by the phase factor e to the minus i omega sub n t. Or in Dirac notation, you can take each ket and multiply it by e to the minus i omega nt. And that tells you what the wave function does later. So the goal of this computing project is to set the wave function up so that the electron is in the left half of the well, and then to compute the behavior of the electron at future times. By what I mean by behavior is what the behavior of the wave function, of course. So in order to do that, you're going to need to learn a few more Python tricks. I'm guessing you guys mostly know these, but just as a reminder, if psi is an array of complex numbers, to get the squared magnitude, to get an array where each element of the array is the squared magnitude of the corresponding complex number, you can use the ABS function, ABS. It stands for absolute. Uh, it calculates the absolute magnitude of the phasor in each cell. And of course, to get the squared magnitude, we have to square it. Remember in Python, squaring is done by the double star operator, same as Fortran. Then um, to get the sum of the square magnitudes, we can use the sum function. The sum function is a, it's really a method of an array object. If you just call sum directly, it'll add up all the elements of the array. 
if you slice the array first, which means you take a portion of the array, you can sum up a f some part of the array. So to calculate, for example, the probability of being on the left, you might want to um, add up all the elements up to the halfway point. So to, to do that, you'd calculate the uh, slice of psi from 0 to the length of psi over 2, take the absolute value of those elements, square them, and sum them. And that's uh, an easy way to do it in one line. All right, so your mission is to compute the wave function at any time, compute the probability of finding the particle on the left half in the left half of the well. It should be in the left half of the well. Graph the result of that probability calculation as a function of time, and to graph the expectation value of the position of the electron, in other words, the expectation value of x, as a function of time. That's interesting because that's related to the dipole moment of the electric charge uh, in many systems that involve electrons. Just to remind you how to do a graph in Visual Python, you, uh, you import from visual.graph all the symbols. That gets you a symbol called gDisplay, so you can create a graph window with a title and an x and y axis label. You can create a curve that acts in that display using the gCurve object. You'll want to specify a color. And then you can make some kind of a loop that calculates stuff. And inside the loop, you'd want to do a gr.plot. So gr.plot will actually plot a point on that graph. You can have as many graphs as you like per display. You just create as many gCurve objects as you like. And you can have multiple G displays, and uh, each G display could have different graphs. So in the example that I'll show you in a minute, you'll see that I've got two graphs, two windows, with each of them with a graph, and the, uh, the visual window that has the three-dimensional arrows spinning around, and all three of them run at the same time. I'll also provide on the K drive, there'll be a starter program that gets you started, it includes everything you need up to the time part. So it sets up the arrows, sets up the coefficients, sets up the uh, curves and the display windows, but then it, it leaves you to compute the behavior of the wave function uh, for all future times. So that's something you're going to have to work out. But uh, let's look at the demo and uh, see what it looks like. So in this window, you see the arrows all confined to the left edge of the well. In this window is the plot of the probability of finding the electron on the left edge of the well as a function of time. And the bottom window has the expectation value of position along with the expectation value plus and minus the uncertainty in position graphed as a function of time. So let's go ahead and I'll click the window and that'll start the thing running. And you can see the probability is going up and down. It reaches zero and then it goes back up to one and then it goes around and at the same time the position of the particle, the expectation value, is kind of bouncing around inside the well. Eventually we get back to a total phase of 2 pi which puts the probability back, you can see the probability of being the left edge of the well, now it goes back to 1, the arrows return to their original uh, condition and the expectation value of position is once again um, on the left edge of the well and, and the probability is confined to the left edge of the well. So that's the way the program ought to work when you run it. Uh, you can find the write-up for Project 3 on the K drive along with a starter program that will get everything running up to the time evolution itself. So have fun!